about uh, two ways that the U.S. government combats fraud using prosecutions and exclusions. I'm going to talk a little bit about compliance, data analytics, information sharing, and awareness. And these are all tools that the government uses to combat fraud and create a culture of anti-fraud. So compliance. Um, providers, meaning physicians and hospitals and pharmacies and the different cogs in the healthcare wheel, they are all required now to demonstrate anti-fraud compliance. They must participate, and this is mandatory and it has to happen annually, participate in anti-fraud compliance training where they're, they're learning about the different types of healthcare fraud and how to identify them. They also learn about the different kinds of healthcare laws and they learn about how to become a whistleblower if they do see healthcare fraud. They have to demonstrate a compliance plan and they have to demonstrate that they have a compliance officer. So this, this rule can be for a physician's office that's small and only has three or four physicians or for a hospital that has 1,500 employees. They have to still demonstrate a compliance plan, a compliance officer in the organization to ensure that there's an anti-fraud culture. And they have to be able to demonstrate this compliance prior to being able to bill Medicare for services. So this is part of our new law that requires them to demonstrate this compliance. And they're audited for these compliance plans. So when a physician applies to bill Medicare, they have to demonstrate that they understand what healthcare fraud is and how, how they can recognize it. And all the employees of that particular physician's office, whether they are involved in medical services or not, must also participate in this training. Data analytics. This is the most powerful way that we have to fight fraud. We create predictive models to predict the likelihood of fraudulent behavior. We analyze claims for patterns of fraud. We build rules in the payment system so that claims for medically unlikely events are not paid. Uh, for example, if you have a 75-year-old woman, she's not going to have a maternity claim. So you can write a rule in your system that you will never pay for that particular instance. You can write rules in your system that you will not pay for particular cardiac procedures without the right diagnostic tests happening prior to that procedure. You could create rules in your system to not pay for things that have not been approved and covered, like as Alana's example, you know, a cosmetic surgery to make your stomach look flatter um, would not be a covered service in the U.S. Um, so you can write a rule in your system so if someone bills for that procedure, it's not being paid. And the U.S. healthcare systems, um, the U.S. healthcare insurers um, have very complex analytic systems that they deploy. And uh, Alana's organization, WellPoint, has one of the best systems uh, probably in the world. They use a mixture of predictive models and prepayment models. And then they also have a team of investigators that then investigate the specific instances that are uncovered by their model. The U.S. government has started a provider screening program. So if you, and I'll back up a little bit, um, prior to uh, maybe five or six years ago, um, physicians uh, used something called an NPI, a National um, Provider Identifier, to bill Medicare. And it was very easy to apply for this number. You just worked to the government and you applied for a number. So what happened was a lot of fraudulent people would apply for multiple numbers and they'd bank them and they hid them and then they would pull these numbers out and build the government until the government realized that's not a correct number. And that's Alana's example where she's in Miami this week, stolen a physician's identif identification or billing as if they are an insurer or a provider but they aren't anything at all. They're not even a business. So the government realized that there is a lot of these out there, so we need to find a way to figure this out. So they created a tiered system um, of provider screening. So they look at, they verify any provider, the address, um, they conduct a license verification. So they might look across all the states to make sure that person has been licensed, and they might find that that person lost their license in one state and applied to a new state for a new license. Um, that would create what we call a red flag, something that we would need to check out further. They do database checks. They look for social security numbers. 
They look for a tax ID. They look for tax delinquency. They look to see if the person is dead. That's a very frequent scheme in the U.S. is people get a hold of dead providers identifications and then they bill. And the government doesn't know that the provider has died, so they'll continue to play, pay the claims. Um, the government will go out and do unscheduled or unannounced visits, very similar to what Alana is doing in Miami right now, visiting these phantom organizations to see if they're there or not. Um, and then they'll, depending on how, how much risk they've identified, they'll fingerprint and run fingerprints of the people who work in the organizations. <coughs> This is a very rigorous screening program. This is something that's new. We've only rolled this out in the past two, three years. Um, it's been very successful. U.S. government um, uses information sharing because one of the best ways to identify fraud is to share information between entities. Your organization alone might be seeing a physician and his practice pattern looks perfectly normal. He might be billing for services and it seems like, oh, he's billing for eight hours of service. But you take that practice pattern and that physician and you pool it with other people's data and you find out that that physician's billing your health plan and another and the federal government and a state government and perhaps an entity in England eight hours a day. And there's no way of that physician can be doing all that work. So by pooling the data, it allows for much more robust and better analysis. It allows new patterns to be uncovered where someone could potentially, and the fraudsters are so sophisticated, they do know how to stay underneath a fraud threshold. They know how to make their practice patterns look like normal patterns. But if you push different pieces of data together, then you can identify these outliers much easier. There's a new initiative in the United States called the Healthcare Prevention Partnership. And it's been more than two years in development. This is a joint, um, and we've got two departments within the uh, U.S. government that fight fraud, uh, the Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice. They've banded together with associations, insurers, and other private and government and law enforcement groups. And they've come together to create a pooling partnership for data. So we identify, we come together in meetings, and both Alana and I sit on this healthcare fraud prevention partnership. We come together in meetings, we identify certain fraud vulnerabilities that we have all noticed. For example, uh, one of the ones is phantom providers. Um, we pull our data based on this study, and then we do, we do specific analysis to identify these vulnerabilities. Um, we're hoping that as time goes on, this will become, right now it's in its infancy and there's only about 15 insurers that are, that are actively part of this partnership. We're hoping as time goes on that everybody will be part of the partnership and will be able to fight fraud much more effectively using this data. But pooling data is a very effective way to combat fraud. And then outreach. Some of the things that the U.S. government does, they do training, especially training for medical students. So there is a special program that they have that they train medical students on how to identify fraud and about correct morals uh, when you are a physician. Um, they have fraud hotlines. So if someone recognizes fraud, they can call into a toll-free number and report something that they're seeing. They have a 10 most wanted list television and print marketing, and they also have volunteers within the community who serve as fraud patrols. I'll show some examples. This is the Stop Medicare Fraud website, and this, if you'll see in the middle, there's something called the Senior Medicare Patrol, and you'll see uh, three senior citizens or elderly people. Um, these people volunteer their time um, to become an advocate, and they answer the phones and speak to people about healthcare fraud, and then they report that and what they find um, to a government agency. These are the different kinds of partnerships they've created to fight fraud. And these people will go out to the communities and explain to people about what fraud is and help them find it. This is our 10 most wanted healthcare fraud list. These are people who have committed fraud in the U.S., and um, as they get caught, they'll publish information about them on the website. And I've provided these websites at the end of the presentation. Okay, well, I wanted to talk about some of our strategies. Um, we use rule-based data mining, um, which is, for example, um, we will 
look at all of our providers in a specific category and let's take psychiatrists and we'll see who's getting paid the most and who's seeing the most patients and are they outliers and with that we will identify how many patients they see a day and how they bill. So if a psychiatrist or a psychologist bills for a one-on-one -on -one, um, psychological therapeutic visit for one hour, what would you estimate the amount of patients they could see a day? Um, maybe 8, 10, 12 at the most? Um, Often what we do is we look at our data and we'll see that they've billed for up to 50 patients in one day. And we know that this isn't possible because there's not 50 hours in a day. So we open an investigation and start um, tracking them, looking at them, see what they've been billing. And sometimes we see that they were billing while they were overseas on vacation or they were billing when on Sundays and holidays when they were out of town or at home with their family. So that's one of the strategies we, we use to look at providers. Um, patients. Um, we look at different patient um, trends. One of our biggest one right now are our doctor shoppers. And these are the patients that go from doctor to doctor to get their opiate medications. Um, we try to limit um, the amount of, of pain medication that they get if they don't have an underlying medical necessity, but they often fake um, a lot of their diagnosis and go to the agency room with a migraine, a toothache, or back pain using any type of diagnosis that's very difficult to um, verify or validate so that they can get their prescription for drugs. And we monitor that by watching how many emergency rooms they visit in a certain amount of time for these soft tissue diagnoses. Um, we had one patient last year that went to 58 different emergency rooms. Not one of them were the same and they were for either toothache, migraine, or backache so that they could get their drugs. Um, we create an anti-fraud culture. We do a lot of training. We do a lot of outreach with the neighborhoods. We try to um, be very, very high profile in our Congress to, so that they know that the private insurers have part to fight a lot of the fraud. Um, and then I want to talk about our compliance plan. We have a very extensive compliance plan. Um, this includes the code of conduct, which defines our commitment to all the legal and ethical requirements. We have a compliance officer that's in charge that it, of our code of conduct and that it's followed and executed. We have a lot of channels for reporting fraud. They can report fraud online to us or we have a hotline. Um, we receive 800 to 900 calls a month on our hotlines of people reporting fraud. And then we have a very robust anti-fraud training program which um, takes place each year. Um, so the role of the Special Investigation Unit and, and our Special Investigation Unit is made up of um, a lot of retired FBI agents, um, attorneys, um, let's see, retired Coast Guard members. We have three doctors on our SIU staff. We have a chiropractor. We have a podiatrist. Um, we have mathematicians working on our data. Um, we have a, a psychiatrist that does a lot of our um, psych fraud for us. So we use the latest anti-fraud technology, which includes predictive modeling. Um, that is a, a tool that the credit card companies use 
to profile your spending when you use your Visa or MasterCard. So if you um, ever get a call from your credit card company and they ask you if you just um, charge some scuba equipment in Miami, Florida, and you're in Indonesia, um, that does not fit your profile, so they're going to stop that charge unless you say that you are in Miami. We're doing the same thing with medical claims. We're looking for anything that's extremely aberrant from a profile of that specialty, and we're taking a hard look at it to see if it could be fraud. So we're trying to use the latest and greatest technology to be proactive about our fraud. We share information with all of our competitors regarding the bad guys. We're all at war against the fraudsters. And we have a very close partnership enforcement. We talk to them almost on a daily basis and work with them to get a lot of these providers prosecuted and put in prison. Next slide, Erin. So I just wanted to talk about one of the examples that we're working on right now. I am actually in Florida um, because we have a list of potential fake or false storefront providers. And these are usually common criminals or um, doctors that have lost their licensure that set up a storefront clinic which in reality is not existent, they're not seeing any patients, but somehow they've gotten a hold of medical identification so that they can bill claims to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, I have a list of 123 different addresses in the Miami area. I've been here since Monday. And I'm driving to each of the locations. I'm taking pictures of them. If they appear to be operational, I'm going inside and I'm talking to the employees. Um, and so far, I have um, gone to 39 different properties, and only two have been valid and operational. Um, I have seen everything from abandoned buildings to buildings with um, orders nailed on the door that they were going to demolish the building. Um, I've seen um, homes with swimming pools that are doing group therapy around the swimming pool and billing, billing us for um, psych therapy, um, all sorts of storefront types of providers. and. And if we can successfully suspend payments, um, there is a possibility right now that we can save um, $5 million going forward just from stopping a lot of this behavior. So sometimes you just have to get in your car and drive out there and do the work, um, boots on the ground, to, just to get it accomplished. But this was very worthwhile. There were some buildings downtown Miami that had they were high-rise buildings that had 15 different durable medical equipment companies within, at least half of which were storefronts and nothing more. They were um, phantom. So we're making a lot of progress. It's, uh, it's a constant battle, but we're, we're trying to fight the good fight against fraud. Next slide, Erin. I think that's our last slide, Alana. Okay, so I guess we'll have a little time for some questions.